so, so Doug will talk about uh, UC Rex today, and this is an initiative that we started about uh, five years ago. Fantastic. Yeah, so um, Doug Bell from UCLA. I'm an internist and informatics researcher, and um, uh, I happen to be the chair of UC Rex Executive Committee this year. Um, so as many of you know, UC Rex is a system set up uh, to facilitate data sharing among the five UCs. Um, and, uh, you know, really, Lucilla was uh, the initial, and I think Mike Hogarth, the driving force behind this. And, and uh, uh, even before UCLA had a CTSA, you guys were working on a proposal for this. And, uh, but then when uh, UCLA, the fifth uh, UC to get a CTSA award, uh, joined, uh, I think that was extra impetus, and, uh, and UCOP got behind this. But um, I think the... the the goals of the data sharing were really multiple, but the first thing, the lowest hanging fruit, was to assist clinical trials uh, and uh, address the problem that clinical trials often fail to meet recruitment targets. Uh, we could use technology uh, to help investigators find eligible patients. Um, and we wanted to use the data from the 5 UC uh, uh, health system, academic medical centers, actually involves 10 hospitals, uh, large volumes of patients uh, that we see every year. I won't read that off, uh, uh, especially a lot of tertiary care uh, in, in Cal California. And the initial vision was to enable researchers to query clinical data from all uh, UC campuses through a unified system with a cross-institutional IRB uh, approval process as well. Um, so. Uh, um, just some highlights of uh, getting it established and governed. We, it was funded uh, by UCOP initially in uh, 2011, and, uh, and we have funding uh, to 2016. Uh, the governance uh, was set up so that uh, UC Rex uh, reports to UC Braid, which is the uh, coalition of the five CTSAs. And so the, the five CTSA uh, uh, PIs uh, are really our oversight group. Um, and, uh, and then we have a 10-member executive committee for UC Rex, which consists of one voting member from each campus uh, that's named by the CTSA director and one non voting member from each campus that's named by the health system CIO so that we could get a uh, strong buy-in from the health systems. Um, and then really important to the functioning of uh, UC Rex and its effectiveness has been working groups uh, that uh, uh, that really are the, where the work gets done. And um, there's a technical strategy working group that, uh, that reviews um, technical options. Its initial decision was to use I2B2 Shrine uh, as, the, uh, as the at least initial platform for UC Rex. Uh, uh, but that group continues to meet and, and focus on uh, uh, technical strategy decisions going forward. Uh, data harmonization is extremely active, and that's really what we're going to talk about uh, later today. Um, uh, so, uh, so I won't go into that too much. Technical implementation in ETL uh, does a tremendous amount of work uh, setting up, uh, you know, I2B2 so far, and then uh, extracting, transforming, and loading data out of the EHRs at each site. Um, User support focuses on user accounts, provisioning, training, uh, and uh, and it, you know increasingly we'll be focusing on uh, promotion of use of the system, and then uh, there's a data quality group that's relatively newly formed uh, to look at uh, the uh, data across sites and uh, uh, and do auditing of of data quality. So. Um, uh, as I said, we initially picked uh, the Shrine I2B2 open source software from Harvard, uh, and um, I'll be talking a little bit more about how that works. Um, uh, but so, but it, it's actually two separate systems: the the I2B2 system, informatics uh, for integrated biology and bedside, and then uh, w which is what operates at each site to create a data repository, and then the Shrine is the is. Uh, Shared Health Research Information Network, which um, uh, networks together the different I2B2 instances. Um, and uh, it, its strength is really that it's, it's a self-service um, system for cohort identification by investigators. And um, I'm going to show you, there's a drag and drop interface for those who haven't seen it, where you can uh, select the concepts that, uh, that you want as an investigator to find out 
you know, how big might my cohort be? You drag them over uh, onto uh, this panel here. So this would be a query looking for opioid dependency and, uh, and not low back pain, which it happens to be lumbago in, in ICD. So you can actually uh, use some Boolean logic here to make that a not. And, uh, and so what happens then uh, when you, um, uh, as an investigator, create that query, <clears throat> it, uh, the, <clears throat> the Shrine software distributes it across the site. So, so you may be at UCLA, you submit your query, uh, the uh, Shrine system sends that out to, e to uh, another system at each site. Mm -hmm. um, those uh, systems query the underlying, uh, query actually a database that's specifically set up and dedicated for this uh, project that, where the data has been extracted from the um, uh, underlying source systems ahead of time into uh, a harmonized data format across each site. Uh, so then those query results get gathered back up by the Shrine system sent back to you and you see them in your interface so then at the bottom uh, when, your when your query comes back, you find out the numbers of patients uh, that meet your criteria at each site, and this is a, a real query that we ran against our data. Um, so that's how it works, and uh, what we've done so far is uh, put in uh, uh, harmonized and, and then put in demographics, ICD-9 diagnoses and procedures, and the top 100 lab tests. Uh, coming very soon will be medications, all outpatient orders and inpatient med administration, uh, body mass index and vital signs, um, uh, which will actually just be the last values from each encounter. So as opposed to trying to, uh, for instance, during a hospitalization, get all of the vital signs, which would be a much different uh, uh, endeavor. So uh, this is the amount of data that we have uh, at, in UC Rex as of uh, uh, this summer, a couple of months ago, actually, so it's growing. But uh, we had uh, 11.8 million distinct patients across all the sites, uh, half a billion total observations, uh, and uh, b broken down, you know, in this way. So uh, uh, quite a few lab results, um, uh, and uh, and this was just um, uh, this was just the top 100 lab results. And actually, we didn't have values at that time, uh, lab values, uh, which we do now. And we have vital status, actually, also, which is just in-hospital death. We haven't linked this to uh, death records. Um, and uh, medications is not live yet, so that doesn't count. So um, we've officially been live since October. Uh, we, were, we were in a pilot phase here where our usage was low, but then uh, uh, officially went live October 1st. And uh, in the subsequent quarters, we've at least at UCLA had, had uh, ramping up uh, numbers of queries uh, from uh, researchers, um, but uh, we um, we this is now uh, a big target for the coming year is to pr uh, um, stimulate more use by by researchers across the five campuses. Mm -hmm. um, one other thing that's interesting you can uh, find in the data is you, you, you can do uh, some exploratory research almost in the data. Uh, when I was presenting at the Autism uh, uh, UC Autism uh, Summit a couple of weeks ago, and they asked me, could we just look for associations between disease even within the data that you have, and uh, wondered whether just even as a validation we could look for the known association between autism and seizure disorders. So in about uh, 15 minutes, uh, um, I whipped this together, and we were able to see that uh, we had 900 patients who had both seizure disorder and autism. We had uh, on the order of uh, six to 7,000 patients who had only one of those two. And then in the uh, zero to 17 age range, we had about 800,000 patients who had neither. Um, and so you could just put together a quick uh, contingency uh, tables and see that the relative risk of seizures given autism or autism given uh, uh, seizures I think I got this backwards, uh, was, uh, was 13 in both cases, and that actually passed uh, the uh, smell test with them that, that, that looked like it, those are the correct, uh, um, pretty close to the correct uh, relative risks that you would expect for, for autism and seizures. So, uh, so that was a nice validation. 
So now we're moving to uh, the next stage, which is how do we get patient level data to investigators? And for limited data sets, which uh, as you may know is uh, de-identified uh, except for service dates and zip codes, it's very good for retrospective type research though. Uh, we have uh, agreements that one can obtain, uh, investigators can obtain a limited data set from all five uh, UCs uh, with one IRB approval um, where only the PI needs to sign the data use agreement uh, with each medical center um, and no local PI is needed. So, uh, so if Lucilla wanted to do a study of autism uh, that only involved limited data sets, she could get the get a, a, an equivalent data set from UCLA, from UC Davis, uh, and, uh, and not have to have anyone at UCLA or UC, UC Davis actually involved, uh, uh, other than you know, the uh, informatics team to extract the, uh, the data. Uh, she would just sign a data use agreement uh, uh, with each uh, site. Um, so uh, that's where we stand now, uh, and we may, you know, continue to use iDash and move that forward to even make that more efficient. Uh, uh, then uh, for identified data, one does have to have a local PI, uh, uh, but we can use the trust and rely mechanism that exists between the UCs uh, to streamline that process, um, and then that data could be used to go ahead and recruit patients. Um, and. Uh, you know, we are looking at doing that for the, uh, as, as uh, Lucilla mentioned, for some of the, uh, um, uh, uh, P the uh, patient power research networks um, that are affiliated with UCs. Uh, and then, uh, you know, as I mentioned, we can uh, securely provision data sets. We're getting set up to securely provision data sets through iDash. And uh, mm -hmm. um, I'll just then mention the there's uh, future efforts that we'll be talking more about. The, uh, NCATS Act is uh, the Advancing Clinical Trials Network, um, which is uh, uh, going to be a, a shrine network eventually involving all 62 CTSAs uh, with uh, an ontology uh, that will be harmonized with the PCORNET uh, clinical data model. And, uh, and I, I think we're expecting uh, upgrades in shrine uh, uh, as, as part of that, that uh, uh, we're hoping, anyway, uh, that, that there will be upgrades in Shrine that will help uh, make that work better. I won't go into that unless somebody wants to talk about that. And then uh, uh, we're uh, going to further establish our data quality and evaluation program. We're going to continue adding data over the coming year, uh, you know, especially we're hoping to get to uh, uh, culture results. I, I think that would be our most uh, ambitious thing that we get done this year uh, for microbiology. And then uh, we're hoping to add at least uh, UC-affiliated children's hospitals, uh, including uh, Oakland Children's, Rady, and, and Chalk, which are not in there right now. And um, that's where we stand. So I don't know if this. All right. Well, thanks for making it shorter so we have time for questions of anyone. Jane? What have been the roadblocks and what do you anticipate might be the successes in bringing them on board? We just can, had a, a, Can you repeat yeah, sure. the question? Oh, Sorry. Sh absolutely. Uh, the question was, uh, what roadblocks have we experienced with Rady Children's Hospital uh, and, and what might we do to move things ahead with getting them on board? Um, and uh, they, um, they uh, wanted to make sure that there was, would be some uh, advantage to them. Uh, so one, one question they had was whether uh, there were significant um, uh, children from other uh, UC sites that that would help uh, um, you know help investigators at Rady do their research and and uh, the the answer is yes uh, you know it's true that Oakland Children's is not in there and and uh, um, and Chalk is not in there but but Mattel Children's Hospital is and um, and then they also wanted there to be some uh, 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 you know ability for them to um, it, the, the concern was that they would be releasing their data into some unknown universe, and I think we just had to do some education on, on that. That, the, that this, especially with this shrine architecture, uh, one does not release their data at all. Uh, and, uh, the, and, and if an institution wants to withdraw, they can withdraw immediately uh, and their data is gone because, uh, you know, there's just no access to the data anymore. So, uh, uh, um, 
that's that's the advent the shrine architecture was really set up uh, for the Harvard uh, um, uh, teaching hospitals where they are all independent nonprofits they don't always trust each other and uh, and so this uh, this architecture where anyone can unplug at any time and be out is uh, was was an advantage probably so uh, I just wanted to say that if you need a use case to present to the people at mm. Radies uh, I would be happy to volunteer okay um, we do use the FIS database which is the pediatric hospital information systems which contains uh, some of the UCs but not mm. all of them it's missing UC Davis and it's missing UCSF hmm. So, um, and Children's Hospital is part of that, and Oakland Children's Hospital is part of that. So, and they pay $100,000 a year to mm. be part of that network and to gain access to those data. And it's actually searchable and queryable in a very similar way to what you've described here. Mm. So, it, it, it might be interesting to look at the opportunities for linking those two because it's a specific pediatric focused database. There are 44 independent freestanding children's hospitals in the United States of America, and 39 of them pay hundreds of thousands of dollars to be part of this network, and they use the data and the information from all the other hospitals for purposes of, I don't know, marketing and financial types of things. Oh. But it is also used for epidemiologic research purposes and by people like me. Okay. Um, so it, it, it might be an opportunity to link. And the guy who's head of it is in Oklahoma, really forward thinking, very collaborative, great guy, and I'd be happy to put you in touch. Thanks. Yeah, it's the FIS, P-H-I-S. Pediatric Hospital. Pediatric Info Hospital Information Services, I think is what it stands okay. for. But if you just type P-H-I-S in Google, you'll get it. Okay, thanks. Great. Well, thank you. And uh, I think Doug will be around to answer any questions uh, during the break.